to each other, probably not a lot, but a few times at conferences and meetings. And whenever I saw Scott was, I found his name on the list, or I saw him somewhere, I always made a point, I wanted, I'd like, I wanted, always made a point to go and talk with him. Because Scott was one of my favorite people to learn about a whole bunch of stuff I didn't know about. Like, for example, how to propagate uh, some of this, one of my things I really like to do is try to propagate hard to propagate plants, downy gentian, prairie lilies, those kind of things. And this is the guy who helped me learn how to do it better, way better. Um, Scott Weber was, um, uh, had a job with the Wisconsin DNR as the, the, the director of the uh, plant nursery. And he has since then changed jobs. He now has, he, but he now is uh, with his wife, the co-owner of the native seed farm. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I got to get my facts right here. He with his wife, Martha, is run Bluestem Farms, a native plant nursery in the Baraboo Hills of Wisconsin. So Scott is especially interesting to me in, in our meeting here today because I think he's going to challenge the way we think about prairie reconstruction, what our constraints with, and a piece that is especially interesting to me is, in his words, uh, why we confuse economic limitations with ecological uh, limitations. So with that, I can use Scott Weber. Okay, this, uh, I'm really grateful to be here. Uh, this is giving me an excellent opportunity when I go back home and people ask me, where did you go for your winter vacation? <laughs> Those that know me, I, I, I've always had sled dogs for about the last 30 years, so I like snow and cold. Uh, so I get what I deserve. I actually began my restoration career in southeast Minnesota, so it's sort of like coming back to uh, where I began. A um, couple of things I want to say, though. Um, I want to thank uh, Craig Meyer and Pauline for introducing me to your group, and especially Melinda for giving me a ride from La Crosse. That was very nice. It was only it was very nice to only have to drive for two hours instead of six, or seven. Um, I'm also uh, putting on my prairie enthusiast hat to remind myself that I'm not talking really about what necessarily I have done. I've worked for. Uh, the Wisconsin DNR for a number of years. Uh, I've done a lot of projects for both state and federal lands, um, nonprofits, um, private clients, and pretty much everything in between. And so, uh, why am I up here? There are a lot of other people who I work with that should be up here, so you shouldn't take my word for it. There are other people that will back me up. And I'm not particularly nervous, but I do get nervous when I have to give a talk, when I have to contradict what was said earlier by somebody else. <laughs> and, you know, everybody takes everything personally, so I can't say that. But with prairie restoration or reconstruction, if you've been at it for long enough, you know that everybody has different opinions about how to do something based upon their own experience. So that's a major issue, and don't think that I have all the answers. That's not what I'm here for, but I'm here to tell you what experiences we've had and how successful they become. Um, incidentally, this talk began as a 15-minute presentation for Society for Ecological Restoration um, conference in Madison. And the primary title, um, the title had the word economics in it. And number one, never put economics in the title when you're speaking to a bunch of ecologists because you won't get the audience that you want. They'll be off, you know, doing something else. Um, but I have to say, though, that the economics, um, the cost and availability of seed, um, how soon people expect results, how those results are defined, all the economic and social factors, to me, trump virtually any ecological limitation that these plants have, unless perhaps you're doing a reconstruction on mine tailings, or for one instance, I had uh, somebody with a manure spreader spread a bunch of manure on a freshly seeded ground with prairie drop seed, and I got probably the tallest lamb's quarters in the world, and the moor broke down. And in that case, yeah, there are some other limitations, but 
Primarily it's about, um, I work with the DNR and I did almost 15 years of seed growing and seed purchasing. And so I have some of that data here. Not too much, just pie charts, easy to read. Um, and it shows exactly, you know, how the influence of cost and availability directly affects what's planted. Okay, this is really a story about uh, the downy gentian and other species like this. And this sort of plant, I feel, has been greatly misrepresented and misunderstood in the literature. Um, it's basically, uh, if, you've, if you've been at all the prairie conferences, if you've studied the books, if you've got the tall grass restoration handbook, um, essentially it all goes into the ecological limitations and the economics maybe get a page, maybe not even that, maybe a sentence, and it's kind of dismissed because you're an ecologist you're looking for ecological reasons, not economic reasons. And as a seed producer, I know very much firsthand what the economic limitations of seed production are. So for the gentian, for instance, its seed production must be subsidized by something else. If you're a grower, anything you're growing that takes longer than one year to grow must be subsidized by something else, whether it's grant money, sales of other species, whatever. And that's something that consultants and people who are not directly in the nursery industry know. Um, it's very difficult to say, okay, I'm going to say take a quarter acre and try to grow a quarter acre of gentian. That's enormously expensive. Your yield is small, and the results are not exactly um, predictable. But uh, Again, you've got in literature telling you not to grow them. So you've also got the resistance of the market to plant these because they're saying, boy, we don't have any success with this. Don't plant them. And so there's a very disincentive for somebody who wants to earn money and sell this species to even do it unless it's subsidized by something else. So if you come away with no other point today than this, it's that I believe popular restoration ecology basically is about blaming the plants and not the seed mix. Um, so I selected this photo because this particular gentian is defying everything that you read. It's only two years old. It's growing in soil that has never been in prairie, probably not at least since European settlement. Half of the topsoil is probably down in the bottom of the ocean off the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, we have not added anything to this. No inoculants, no mycorrhizae, nothing. And it's two years old, it's blooming, and it's just happy, and this plant is still alive after 20 years. Um, so I began my restoration career at Carleton College in about 1979. I took over a prairie project because all the people who started it graduated, and I became an arboretum assistant. And one of the first plantings that I did that I was responsible for was this particular one. It's not my best slide of the project, but all that sort of grayish um, plant is lead plant. And when I had the seed, I had a lot of seed for that, and my professor told me that I needed inoculant or it would not grow. And this is a point in time where that wasn't available. And we just spread the seed, and 30 years later, the lead plant is doing very well. So that was my first indication that not everything that's out there is correct. And in fact, I wanted to read this. This is from the Tallgrass Handbook in the appendix. It says, legume seeds require rhizobium inoculant for successful germination. If the nursery sells legume seeds without supplying inoculant, or at least informing you of the necessity for inoculant, you should be concerned about the qualifications of that nursery. <laughs> And I know for a fact that that's a false statement. And originally I thought maybe some of this rhizobium is coming on the seed in the seed coats. For example, Baptisia, you have the weevils that are underground that are going into the seed pods. That could be a, a vector for transmission. But then I did a study. I was trying to see how much hydrochloric acid I needed to soak Baptisia in to get it to germinate with no stratification. I soaked it for three days in 40% hydrochloric acid. That's enough to kill anything. 
I mean, that'll take your finger off. <laughs> but I got 80% germination. So anybody who's been in this business long enough, before any of the uh, additives, the inoculants, etc., were available, were having success. Any gardener that's grown beans or peas knows that maybe if you had inoculant, you would get a better yield, but the plants still grow. <coughs> and so fundamentally, I think, some of these people writing don't have enough field data or experience or even garden experience to make statements, but they get repeated often because once it gets in a major publication, it's basically treated as the truth. Carleton College had a very nice uh, prairie, McKnight Prairie. If you're familiar with southeast Minnesota, this is just uh, due east of uh, Northfield. And this was preserved by Dr. Paul Jensen, who died a few years ago, but it was instrumental in preserving this. And had a number of students <coughs> taking care of it. This is where we learned how to burn. We didn't need cards or authority. We just called the local fire warden and said, we're going to torch this. And, oh, okay, just be careful. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we had, we had a few problems, but anyway, uh, we survived. But anyway, this became a model, this became a seed source for the Carleton Restoration Project, which has now expanded to several hundred acres. Well, after um, Carleton, several of us migrated to the International Crane Foundation because they had just bought their new farm and it was primed for restoration. There was a lot of oak savanna in prairie that could be planted. And um, they needed bodies to do that. George Archibald is seen here, he's the co-founder. He's standing in one of the kettle ponds with his first captive propagated whooping crane chick. Um, this is a major milestone for him. But he was very concerned about the habitat. So he made habitat restoration for this site a number one priority because what are good, what good is it captively rearing these cranes if you don't have any habitat to release them into? So that was a major theme that he wanted there. We also had the Alto Leopold Reserve, the shack represented by Leopold Shack. That was great to have because the Crane Foundation had stuff to do, not a lot of money. The Leopold Foundation had paid internships. So many of us wound up splitting our time between the Leopold folks and the Crane folks. And uh, we even got better housing from the Leopold folks. We didn't have to sit in a tent for the month of December, which is very nice. <coughs> One of the sites we collected seed from also for the Crane Foundation was the Volca Prairie. This is a very interesting prairie. It's one of the larger remnants in Wisconsin. It's surrounded on all sides by channels of the Wisconsin River, so through time it's been burned officially and unofficially, even by the fire chief. Um, but one thing I noticed about it when we collected seed there is the downy gentian and the drop seed form very distinct uh, associations. If I wanted to collect the seed for the gentian, I'd just look for the drop seed. Unfortunately, in the flood of 93, those drop seeds uh, stands were completely eliminated and taken over by Big Blue Stump, which I'll get to a little bit later. But anyway, that was a model. If I wanted to do a restoration of the Crane Foundation, I wanted the gentian and I wanted the drop seed. So we made it, well, at least I made a, a big effort to try to make sure that that was included. So in 1980, in the fall, that was, I was given about an acre to plant. It was an experimental planting. It was done in the fall. And that was considered quite experimental because for most people's experiences, the spring plantings achieved better results. And that's pretty much what happened here. For the first five years, under study um, by UW landscape architecture students, the spring planting that was done the following year had the highest percentage native cover and identifiable seedlings than the fall planting. Then in five years, somebody looked at the fall planting and realized, holy smokes, that's where all the diversity is. That's where all the forbs are located. That's where we have a gentian and drop seed community. So the spring planting is now basically solid big loosening. So using the same seed that was collected in 1980. So they're, according to their records, the seed mix difference is very minor. The big thing here was simply the date that it was planted made a huge difference and basically dictated the trajectory of the planting for decades. 
And the reason for this is, I think, very subtle. But in the fall planting, all those species that need stratification, that germinate at very low soil temperatures, mm -hmm. have a distinct advantage if they're fall planted. They can germinate as soon as the frost is out of the ground, whereas the big blue stem planted in the spring has the advantage. And so by the time the next winter rolls around from the spring planting, all those seeds that germinate have been suffering from predation, probably, probably from fungus diseases or whatever, but for whatever reason, if they survived and germinated one year later, suddenly they had all this big blue stem to compete against. And it's a very strong competitive problem. But I won't say that this is always true. There have been spring plantings that we've done with DNR that for all practical purposes are okay. But for maximizing the um, investment in the rare species, the fall planting really made a huge difference. And incidentally, even today, they use this as a teaching point. They line up people along the boundary between the two plantings. And for the most part, after 30 years, the difference, the boundary between the spring planting and the fall planting is still very distinct. There's been very little infiltration or crossover of the two plantings in terms of species for 30 years. So for all practical purposes there, the date and the seed mix particularly in this case, the date has determined the trajectory of the planting for as long as you can predict. So getting to conservative species, that's actually the title. Um, I get a little nervous because it seems like whenever I give this talk, I'm always contradicting somebody who spoke before me. And so, uh, as Shakespeare pointed out, if someone's coming out, if you're in a, in a position of power and somebody comes out with contrary information, the first thing you do is shoot the messenger, as Rosencrantz and Guildenstern found out. So I get a little nervous, but I know you're nice people, so I won't talk about it. Don't take it personally. But anyway, when we talk about conservative species, there is no good definition that everybody uses. It's a relative term, just like politics. So you can consider, if you're a forest or white oak, to be a pioneer tree species. It will not reproduce in its own shade, it needs grazing, it needs fire, it needs some kind of disturbance. So for all practical purposes, it's a pioneer species. In terms of the forbs you grow, it's a very, very conservative species. It's slow growing, slow to mature, and it, like many other conservative species, does not produce a steady yield of seed or acorn crops over a year. On the other hand, in terms of the master's thesis, Ritipida can be considered uh, conservative species as it was in the SDR conference. And I was thinking, holy smokes, Ritibida? You know, if I were told as a nursery person that I needed to grow a bunch of annuals and pioneer species to get Ritibida growing, I'd say you're absolutely nuts. I mean, I, the only thing I was thinking of is maybe their soils may have been highly degraded, possibly by mine tailing or something. But um, anyway, there's a huge disjunct between some of the theorists and some of the practitioners. It's like we're living on different planets. And neither one of us seem to communicate to each other. Um, so let's look at a case study. Here's Prairie Dock. Prairie Dock, for most people, would be considered a conservative species. It's relatively slow growing in some instances. Um, it's very long lived, perhaps a century or more. And it's very conservative with its seed production. However, here's a planting we did at Madison Audubon. We did it in the fall. And what's the first thing that germinated? The prairie dock. I went out there with my camera. We started looking and see what the first things are. And other than a few Canada wild rye, this was germinating before the black-eyed Susan, before the thistle, before any of our, quote, pioneer species. So my first question is, why can't prairie dock be considered a pioneer species? It's long-lived. It has the attributes of a conservative species, but it's also being a pioneer species. And I think that's the problem. We tend to separate the two, but when we're talking about most prairie species, it's my feeling based on experience that almost all prairie species are pioneer species when in compar comparison with many woodland species. Um, so Madison Audubon, while I'm on this, has been a great project. And over time, 
the quality of the prairies has become very great. This has shooting star, it's got gentians, it's got spring flora, it's got summer flora, it's got fall flora. And it's because we made a concentrated effort first to change planting dates to fall only. We concentrated on seeds of highest value, minimized the collection and planting of the black-eyed Susans and coneflower, in some cases leaving them out entirely. And I would bet if someone did a study of those plantings over time, they would find that the more recent plantings at Audubon that are mature now have a much higher diversity and much more authenticity than plantings that were done in the early 80s, which are now pretty much dominated by tall grass. But this is very stable now. This basically has looked like this for several years. Very little change in diversity and species composition. Here's Chihuahua Prairie, one of the great uh, natural areas in Wisconsin. This is over by the Wisconsin River, uh, Lake Michigan, excuse me. And in the middle of May, it is covered by shooting stars, probably thousands, if not millions. And so my first iteration of this talk was, why don't our plantings look more like this? Um, this is a planting of nothing but shooting star and drop seed. So here, the only difference I've done from any other mix is change the seed mix. This had no special uh, seed preparation. I mean, it was disked for a little bit. Um, but the problem with this planting is that the shooting star takes forever to grow. The first year, it may not be more than one quarter inch in diameter, and it goes dormant by July. So if you're doing a study, it does not appear in your data set. It, is, it contributes zero to percent of native cover. And finally, by year two, well, by year two it's getting a little bigger, but for the most part it didn't bloom till the fifth or sixth year. And this is not viable either for commercially or for research because A, you're just not gonna get your data soon enough. You're gonna have to hold the client's hand ensuring that those little tiny little things are actually shooting stars and someday they will germinate and most people simply don't have the patience for that. Even though, from a cost standpoint, this probably costs about the same as a high diversity mix costing 1500 bucks. I mean, it's probably maybe even half that much because shooting star, when it's stratified, germinates at 90% germ. We know that for a fact. Um, but <coughs> it's just it's just not going to swing it because it's not what people think of as a native prairie, even though if they went to Chiwaki, they would have that model. So here's a pop quiz, because one of the concerns I have is that many of these species just simply fall below the radar of research. Can anybody identify all three of these? Three lily, Viola pinnidifida, and That's a trick. It is, it looks like ice. <laughs> I can't see it. Dang it. <laughs> well, you got an award. You got one of those, right? You only got one? Mm -hmm. Isn't this a prairie lily? Oh. That's a prairie lily. Okay. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice thumb. <laughs> yeah, they, well, that, that's uh, down ejection. If anybody says that's that it doesn't germinate, Either they have really bad seed, they didn't stratify it long enough, but we can get 90% germination on soilless mix in the greenhouse. It's getting it to maturity that takes the time. And oh, you want to know what that little thing is? Yeah. That's a two month old protocorm of a prairie white fringed orchid. And like most orchids, um, especially the cypripediums, they do not form any above ground parts the first year. They will, again, contribute zero to percentage native cover. And even if they get bigger, um, they're not in the seedling identification board. Okay, so now you kind of get my drift here. These are the three, kind of limited to three, but three myths of conservative species are one, seeds germinate poorly. Two, they need virgin or healed soil to grow. And finally, they need pioneer species to pave the way. Now listen to that, because in my 15-minute lecture, the first question I got was, well, don't you need the pioneer species to pave the way? And I didn't really know what to say. <laughs> well, uh, listen next time.
<laughs> the, the corollary myth is that all plantings, given enough time, will become more like our remnant prairies. And I rarely see this happening. I mean, they might change a little bit, but they never, ever get to this quality. This is a railroad remnant near Oshkosh, Wisconsin. So where do these myths come from? Well, I have sled dogs, and there's a, a, an axiom with sled dogs is they will only do what you ask them to do unless they thought of it first. So you have to convince them. You know, you, you get up, you say, come on, out the door, and they'll look at you like, no. It's only when you sit down again that they get off the chair and say, okay, now let me out. That's the way, that's your mode of stop um, Well, these, these myths are everywhere. They're repeated in the literature. Once something, I mean, actually going back to the first Prairie Conferences. And, uh, you know, that's why I'm speaking here, because somebody's got to challenge them. But this is one of the first ones. This is from the 12th. American, North American Prairie Conference in 1992. And this is the stage theory. And this is a, a theory that's widely held. Um, you get your red bacchus in stage one, and then you don't get your lead planter in morpha until stage 13 or 20. And there are three fundamental problems with this uh, whole scenario is that one, it's entirely dependent upon seed mix. To claim that this is the process that had to happen when our native prairies were colonized originally by the original seeds, I think is stretching it. For one thing, you probably wouldn't see black-eyed Susans as the stage one. You'd probably see ragweed and horseweed and some other things that just aren't, you know, economically viable, but probably fairly important. Um, the other thing is that if any nursery actually believed this, they'd be out of business. If they had to wait. 13 years for a stand that drops seed to produce, they'd be out of business unless they had it subsidized in some way. Um, but it's kind of liked by everybody. It's liked by the nurseries because it justifies selling profitable seed mix. It's full of easy to produce species and everybody gets what they like. It's The clients like it because, oh, I've got my black-eyed Susans. My prairie's doing great. It's doing what everybody else's prairie is doing. And finally, the ecologists kind of have to accept this, but I think with a grain of salt, because again, we rarely see it progress to that stage. So my point is that if you're not seeing the amorpha and the sporobolus by the third year, at least as a seedling, um, they probably will never show up. So for example, here's a stand of drop seed I seeded, probably about five to six pounds per acre. No special site prep. Within two years, it's as tall as about, it's about one feet, maybe one and a half feet tall, and it'll be producing seed by its third year. And I have done nothing differently than somebody who planted the uh, stage theory prairie, except that I changed the seed mix. That's all. Here's a, another planting we did a drop seed. We included the gentian. Both were in bloom by their third year. And uh, this is kind of an amazing planting. I, all I did for site prep was rototill it once in uh, October and plant it in early November. That's all. And later on in this pasture, we've just been scattering seed without any site prep whatsoever, just followed by burning. And uh, here's an aerial photo. And the lighter patches, um, especially that square in the middle, that's drop seed. And around it, the brown are all tall grass or um, warm season, a uh, little blue, big blue Indian grass. And after 20 years, those boundaries, just like the Crane Foundation, have remained very distinct. <coughs> now my wife will say, well, wait a minute, I know there's some Indian grass coming into there and blah, blah, blah. But generally, we split a lot of here. <coughs> but generally speaking, uh, drop seed is every bit as competitive as big blue stem. The only difference is who arrived there first. And uh, that's very important. That contradicts the stage theory. It gets more to John Curtis's theories when he was studying at the UW Arboretum and realizing that the succession they were looking at in their forest was not by the book at all. He was realizing that succession was a lot more random than we think. And it largely depends upon which seed got there first. And 
that contradicts uh, a lot of other, especially the folks in Illinois, get really hung up on their stage theory because they invented it. So here's another situation where I think in some cases we're living on two different planets and neither are communicating. So I'll get to the Tallgrass Restoration Handbook. I generally cut off most of the text from this talk because I really rather have you look at the pictures, but the essence of this is true. This is a statement by Virginia Klein. And prairies are uncultivated sites are not very diverse. They're dominated by tall grass and easily established composites. Now that is a true statement. However, the problem with the book is that it starts going off on, oh, it must be the soil, or mycorrhizae, or something like that, when in fact it completely ignores, for the most part, the fact that those are very easy to produce and they're cheap, and they give you a lot of color. So here's the yeah. Only picture I stole off the web, this is a picture on G. Blogston's website, The Contrary Farmer, and he's always been sort of like me, rather contrary. But his point here, and he's talking about commodities, is that an economy based on money growth rather than natural growth will always be subsidized. So we know that with corn and beans, they are subsidized. Um, but it applies even more to prairie <coughs> species. I mean, if you think about it, like I was talking about the gentian, there are very few growers that want to take a risk growing a species like that. Um, they have to be subsidized somehow, and that's a very important point. Um, it makes it very difficult to be a nursery and specialize in rare species because then the buyers think, oh, I can get all the cheap stuff somewhere else, cheaper. And then they come to you and buy you an ounce of shooting star. That, is, that doesn't even pay the diesel fuel to, or, or even the... Uh, thing you buy at Farm and Fleet to scoop it up with. Um, but his point is pretty well taken. Anytime money changes hands for a project, somebody wants a result as soon as possible. They want to maximize their investment. And that is why Rudbeckia and Echinacea and Rotibida dominate. They are cheap. They are always available. They give a lot of bang for the buck. If you are told, for example, that gentians never show up, why would you spend more for that seed, sometimes over a $1,000 a pound, if a pound is even available, when you've been told by experts that your margin, your um, return on investment could be zero? Why do it? It also leads to... Um, looking at some of the traditional planting protocols. So when I started, the, the, the basic scenario was to plant in the spring with a 2x drill. You get your black-eyed Susan the first or second year, and then you try to burn it as soon as possible, usually probably late to, to kill off some of the, or at least set back some of the cool season species. And you pretty much wind up with a stand of big blue stem. And the problems with this are, are many-fold, but with the drill, what you're doing is, if you were putting gentian in the drill, they're probably burying it too deeply. Gentians need light to germinate. So if it's not broadcast and frost-seeded in the soil naturally, you're probably putting it in too deeply. Um, the second issue is that if you're, if you're trying to burn a planting as soon as possible, particularly late to control your cool season species, that is why if for any reason you had shooting star and it germinated, you would be burning it out of your prairie at an early age because at such a small size, they don't have the root reserves to recover. And there is a lot of anecdotal evidence saying that too much spring burning, especially late, eliminates some of the spring flora. So we have these particular phrases. This is straight from the Tallgrass Handbook, and this is from a prominent nursery owner in Wisconsin who ought to know better, but he's basically arguing for his commercial mixes. So when he says less adaptable, I don't really understand that because many of the conservative species are quite adaptable. They're the ones that if you get them in their planting, they're going to be there for the 30 to 40 <coughs> years or more. I think they're just less adaptable to commercial mixes and profitability. Um, again, we've covered the uh, difficulty of defining conservative. Never show up, well, 
you saw in the Crane Foundation plant, and yes, if it were planted at the wrong time of year, it may never show up. But the thing that bothers me, and that gets back to one of the questions in one of the previous uh, slide movies, is finer seeded and slow growing. There is no correlation between seed size and whether or not it germinates or is a successful pioneer species. Seeds come in all different sizes, and some of the smallest seeded species, the black-eyed Susan, ragweed, are very good at colonization. So just because a gentian has small seed does not mean it, there's something fundamentally wrong with it. And finally, lost its vitality or consumed, that could very well be if the seed is planted at the wrong time of the year so it doesn't maximize its potential. Yes, it could be consumed and eaten. And this kind of snowball, you don't have to read all this. this all you have to understand is underground mysteries and mycorrhizal fungi and healing of prairie earth. And I think the person that wrote this, I don't know her background, but you get all the usual suspects, gentians, shooting stars, orchids, lilies, are all lumped into this category. We're missing something. Again, blame the plants and the, their ecology and not our seed mix design. So this is coming out in 1999 and uh, about the same time, you know, we were trying to come to grips with why do we have all the good success that we have and why do other plantings not? Um, but the real clincher was the prairie white fringed orchid. According to the literature, this has one of the highest coefficients of conservatism. Guess where this plant's growing? It's not virgin prairie soil at all. This is a former corn and bean, probably mostly corn, that was put into CRP. Back then, the landowner did not have to plant the seed mix. All he did was burn it, and whatever was in the existing soil seed bank came up. And he just happened to be living across the road where there were a few prairie white friends going. And I know from germination experiments, that these seeds last a long time. It's another issue with them. They don't all germinate the same year. They're one of these species that after one cold treatment, maybe two or three will germinate. After another cold treatment, a few more will germinate. They're designed to spread out their germination over a long period of time because they're really not very long-lived plants. I mean, we've been monitoring these plants for years, and it's very rare that we actually get a good correlation between our GPS points and the plants. They're always moving around. And I think this is partly true because when it flowers, the plant will die unless the conditions are good enough that it can form an offshoot. If it doesn't form an offshoot that year, the plant will die. But it lives, you know, sometimes areas that get flooded out, so it wants to spread out its germination over many years to spread the risk. But this plant is growing on soil that was scraped by a bulldozer for a pond scraping. The landowner will tell you that the best place to look for this plant is on a bulldozer scraping. It has nothing to do with virgin prairie. It has to do with how the land was managed and whether or not a seed source was available to colonize. We had a similar situation. We found a very nice population at the bike trail north of Oshkosh. And I'm looking on the prairie proper trying to count the orchids. My wife, who didn't read the book, went and wrote in the ditch between the prairie and the cornfield, and we found 40 plants, the highest population for the county at that time. Unfortunately, with glyphosate-resistant corn, it's been completely obliterated. But for a while, the conditions on the prairie proper were not conducive. It wanted to colonize new sites because orchids in general do not like competition, and here it found a new place to grow where it essentially um, it shouldn't grow. And we've had the same luck with purple fringed orchid. This has colonized some of our plantings on its own simply because there's an adjacent seed source. And I tell you this soil again, it's horrible soil. Most of this has been flushed down in the drainage and creeks down the Mississippi. So speaking of orchids, these cypripediums have been grown entirely without any fungi. They've been grown artificially. Um, they've been germinated in culture flasks and uh, grown out of blooming size in potting soil in the greenhouse. The number one cause of death of cypripedium <coughs> seedlings in the greenhouse is deleterious fungi. 
that's what kills them. So actually, if I took these plants now and put them out, which I have done, they, in the right soil pH, they do fine. They'll acclimate to their new surroundings pretty well. But the other species, the uh, Liparis lucellii, the Lillifolia, even Spiranthes serenoa, um, can all grow in pots. And in fact, the two toy blades in the Spiranthes are the only orchid species we have that will self seed into other pots in the greenhouse. So their requirements really can't be that complicated. Same with some of the legumes. I planted a lot of lupin for the state because one year our low bid that met the definition of a local nursery was importing their seed from New Zealand. And lupin is one of the species I found that gets mixed up and sold as something else. We get plantings, I'm sure, because of the color of the lupin and its stature that they've slipped in the Russell hybrid or something. So we decided, since this is going for current or blue habitat restoration, we grow all our own seed. We never use a drop of inoculant, not a bit. And finally, just to be scientific about it, I dug the plant up and found good nodules after the second year. So the notion that if we don't provide it, that it doesn't exist is another myth. I think in our climate, bacteria, fungi get around very well. We greatly underestimate also the plants, particularly legumes, of being able to establish themselves because most of this is an agricultural land which has usually, especially if it's coming right out of crops, uh, uh, abundance of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So there's not really anything limiting so much their growth and they can get established and eventually pick up the inoculant on their own. And same thing here is a place that was scraped over by a bulldozer removing a bunch of rock from the basement excavation and Lupin has done fantastic. It's, 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 all he done is throw the seed out in the uh, fall. And on the same or similar site, um, we've got the three species of gentian growing, fringe gentian, bottle gentian, downy gentian. We have the prairie lily, and we've had two pieces, species of orchid come in on their own. The tubercle orchid, and cases ladies' dresses. This is what the soil looks like. This is subsoil, the bulldozer, and farming have completely eliminated the topsoil. And in fact, uh, low fertility is actually a benefit. In fact, the lower the fertility of your soil, the easier it is to get these species growing because they are more efficient with nitrogen, because they do use mycorrhizae, which are evidently able to find their way on their own. It's dealing with uh, soils like the guy that dumped the cow manure all over our site, high fertility is what benefits your weeds. But to say that you need virgin soil to grow these is rather um, misleading. Um, another species, real quick, here's Pedicularis. We seeded the wood bed knee into our pasture, into Old Field, and it's done very well. And it's really important because it's very nice for bees. It's one of these early season species that bees really depend on. And you know, like the, the lupin, you know, in the literature you read, oh, it's parasitizing this or that. Guess what Pedicularis likes in a pot? Its number one favorite plant to grow with in a pot is horseweed. So why are some of these plants isolated? Well, I think it really gets back to a classic work by MacArthur and Wilson, Theory of Bio Biogeography. I mean, essentially, this is what our remnants are. They're islands surrounded by a sea of land use that's totally inhospitable to their survival. Um, so humans, we have become the primary agents of seed dispersal. And the problem is we're also getting some inbreeding depression because this is several miles from the next remnant. What we really need to do, and this is why it's important to consider these species and not just think of substitutes, is that in order for the gentians here to succeed, they need cross-pollination with other individuals. And so if you're not planting out in your gardens, you know, around these remnants, the same species, they're still isolated. Um, for example, we had a bed of Lilium philadelphicum and it spread only 20 or 200 feet in 20 years. Now we've granted 
harvested some of that seed, and a lot of seed's been eaten by ground squirrels and whatnot. But the seed dispersal for some of these species is very slow, and you can imagine trying to get from one of these isolated remnants to several miles to a new site that's managed for its survival. It's a problem with seed dispersal, I think, mostly. Um, So this, but the lily is a good plant to talk about seed production. You have to put a lot of time into this. You have to lay mulch, you have to plant them in mulch to get them to grow well, so you eliminate some of the weeds because you want production as soon as possible. Prairie enthusiasts have done that too, but then you find out, wow, I'm gonna have a great seed crop, and then ground squirrels eat your entire crop. You find out over time by concentrating species, meadow voles can come and eat all the bulbs. Uh, the prairie enthusiast plot had a pretty good yield and then suddenly uh, the plants disappeared and I think it's because a metal vault got underneath their plastic and ate all their bulbs. So you invest a lot of time into this but the yield is not guaranteed. In fact, if anybody had been studying yields, I don't care what species you're talking about, there's essentially a bell curve where you get, even with big blue stem, fairly high initial yield but then it drops off as those roots uh, take over and get more compacted together. Um, with a lot of long-lived species, then the yield curve kind of looks like this. It's dependent upon the <coughs> conditions, whether they've been burned, the rainfall. But you really never get back to that first initial yield that you had when you started. It always drops off. And uh, so that's another disincentive to grow that. You need, you know, it's much easier to plant bergamot, get three or four years, 100 pounds PLS per acre off itself for 10 grand. You made a lot of money, and it's quick. And that's why growing these is very difficult. And this is another thing here, getting back to the island biogeography thing. This is a graph showing the survival rate of yellow lady slipper seedlings. And the highest number, over 500, was from plants that were about 20 miles apart from healthy populations that were crossed. If they're self-pollinated, seedling vigor is practically zero. If you cross-pollinate it with another plant from another state, you're declining um, in vigor. You need those healthy populations, you know, within, I'd say about 50 miles. I think that's a pretty good uh, corollary there between what we used to think about in terms of local genotype. But the problem is this will never be on a study. It takes five year generation time just to grow one lady slipper. That's two years longer than most grants are last for. Um, so this is just my unpublished data. And uh, take it for you what it's worth, but it, the showy lady slipper has the exact same chart curve. When you get plants from healthy populations crossed, the seedling vigor goes way up. If you cross from too far out, the seedling vigor goes down. Self-pollination doesn't cut it. So this, I'm getting to the end of this here. Um, so why does a good seed mix matter? This is a nice, I mean, this is kind of like expensive for good seed when you get this together. You think, oh my God, you know, it's a lot of work and a lot of time and you're just gonna dump it out on the ground. But one thing I did with the state, my uh, primary objective in studying these stands was I wanted to know how much seed you need per square foot to get a reasonable stand. And we found out, for example, for Indian grass, it's about five pounds per acre. Now this was clean seed. We didn't test it because we had cleaned it for many years and we knew it would probably be about 70 to 80 percent PLS. And this is for a production stand. And in the tall grass handbook, they talk about planting a big blue stem at 13 pounds per acre at 40 seeds per square foot. For bergamot, stand of bergamot, how many pounds of seed do you think you need for bergamot per acre? One pound. If you have a cedar that can spread it out evenly over one acre, you only need one pound of bergamot. So here's a clear indication that each species has a different seeding rate. 
And if you don't account for that in your seed mix program, you will overseed, for example, big blue stem or Indian grass. You need, if you're planting, if you know it only takes maybe 15 to 20 seeds of big blue stem for a production stand, then if your seed mix program says 100% and it's 40 seeds per square foot, you've planted it twice the rate you need. And that has serious consequences. I mean, the nursery owner that wrote that should know better that if you planted big blue stem at that rate, your seed production yield would go way down by the fifth year because the plants would be planted too closely together. There's just no more resources. I think, in fact, some people took what we would have used as bulk seeding rates in the old days when we didn't test seed and use them now as PLS figures and they never made the correction because if you're a nursery, you want to sell as many pounds per acre as possible. I looked at one mix, 34 pounds per acre. And it was just going into next to a state park and I had to review the seed mix that a developer was putting in. I told the guy from the development agency, I said, you know, you've been asked to plant a planting rate that's about four or five times what any wildlife manager would plant. And then I got a call the next day, he wanted to hire me on as a consultant. And I said, sorry, I work for the state, I can't do that. But what we did was, we also had the same thing for many different forb species. This is the Wilson Nursery in Boscobel, 1993. And I just evaluated all the different stands of forbs that we had there. And uh, I knew what the planting rate was because I knew how much seed went into it. And I just came up with an aggressive factor. If you're terribly interested, uh, way back in the 1999 winter issue of uh, Ecological Restoration, I wrote an article which was essentially a rebuttal to this book. But it was all about how the seed mix design really makes a difference in the quality and how if we really want to be accurate, we have to increase or dock certain species in our seed mix to compensate for their aggressiveness. This is an example. This is a drop seed plant at maturity. It's a, taking up one entire square foot of space. And many seed mixes have over 100 seeds per square foot. So what happened to the other 99 seeds? I mean, that's a big question. I mean, no. Uh, you can just X out of that. Yeah. No, I guess. Um, so, that, you know, most gardeners know that if they're going to plant their carrots, they can't overcrowd them if they're not going to come back and weed them. And I think a lot of prairie restorations like that, if we can plant as many seeds per possible, as possible for square, per square foot, we get the highest percentage native cover in the shortest period of time, and then we can walk away from it. And so here's a commercial short grass mix that I just pulled off a seed catalog, I'm not trying to pick out any nursery, but uh, this is by weight in ounces per acre, and partridge pea makes up one quarter <coughs> of the mix by weight, and it's sold by weight, so you're thinking, oh, I'm getting, gee, one quarter, one out of every four, three four seeds is a cassia, well, it's not so. If we convert that to actual seeds per ounce, we realize that in that mix, Huchera is making up 58 seeds per square foot. The only thing I can think of is that the nursery must have had a bumper crop of Euchera. But think of the failure rate. I mean, if you want, even if you got one Euchera per square foot, that would be pretty good. And so they're basically anticipating a failure rate of about 98%. And we've grown Euchera in the greenhouse. We know it germinates well. So there are gonna be other things going on here. And as, as it turns out, Cassia, if you go by seed count, only comes out to two seeds per square foot, but that's still good enough for enough color. Um, now with the DNR, this is, I just picked the 2012 seed bid. That was the last one I worked on. This is sort of representative of what I think an average mix is for most people. And at best, we were doing a five to one grass to four ratio. When I started in 1992, it was 50 to 1, and 90% of the grass was switchgrass. So my job was to change this. And I think I was fairly successful. However, this is not ideal by any stretch. Only 3% of the entire order by weight was Forbes over $100 a pound, which is the really good stuff. 
only 3%. And this is how the four border breaks down into seed count. Rebecca Hirta, one out of every three seeds planted was a black eyed Susan. And second was the Enothera biennis or um, evening primrose, and then yellow cornflower. I think we only did very well with the uh, Culver's root because we happened to have a seed plot of it and we generated a lot of Culver's root seed and that has a very fine seed. But essentially what you're looking at is that one out of every two Forbes planted will no doubt be gone in probably five to 10 years. Yellow cornflower probably hang on a little bit more. But when you talk about diversity or Forbes diversity, you know, maybe, maybe some of that overall diversity might still exist, but essentially half of what you planted with Forbes has gone, disappeared, but they're all, in the $20 to $30 price range per pound. So if you're a wildlife manager and you have a budget, 200 bucks per acre, are you gonna take out some of that money by $500 for a pound of shooting star seed or are you gonna get a gazillion pounds of black-eyed Susan? Well, you're probably gonna go for the black-eyed Susan because you're thinking you're getting more bang for your buck. So I went to Curtis's plant ecology lab data this is the ratio we should be planting forbs to grasses. Probably, well, let's say if I budget a little bit, say 25 to 75. So it's about 75% of, by weight, should be forbs seed. And furthermore, if I took that and broke that down and actually added my aggressive factor, the number one species that should be planted out there is lead plant, but only at about five seeds per square foot. Now we don't have a lot of experimental data for this except for the nursery plots. Um, you know, nobody really wants to take this on, but I think what I'm trying to get at is if you're putting percentages in your seed mix formula, don't you want it to kind of be eventually what the percentage is in your final planting 10, 15 years down the road? This is sort of an attempt to get that. And if you doubt me on the lead plant, this is a young prairie state natural area in the South Kettle Moraine. And in some parts of the prairie, it's just solid lead plant. This is a conservative species with a deep root. It's very drought resistant and very long lived. And it will become dominant over time on some of these plantings. Very much not in dominance on many of our plantings. This is the last planting I did with the DNR. We had a lot of lead plant seed. There's the lead plant germinating in the greenhouse just for comparison, but by the second year of our planting, we had excellent lead plant. I bet this probably would have pruned its second or third year. And the year we planted it, um, we planted it in the fall, and the following summer was extremely dry, and I think it actually favored some of these prairie species that are very drought resistant. So in that case, a dry summer actually helped us out. So finally, how do we, I mean, what are the, steps I think that we need to take to improve the quality of our plantings. Well, number one, it helps if you've got a well-dedicated and well-trained volunteer base because they are cheap labor that allow you to go out and collect off of our remnant prairies that have the nice seeds. The great thing about the remnant prairies, especially if they're owned by nonprofits or government agencies, is there's no cost accounting for the taxes and the time it took to get these species established. That's just paid for. But um, if you're a business, that would definitely be a very big cost. So it's a very big advantage to have cheap labor and the seed sources. Incidentally, this is also a great partnership we have with DNR. Madison Audubon volunteers collected most of the seed for this buffer planting. They took over the maintenance of a state natural area and as a result the state got a lot of cheap labor and cooperation with another nonprofit to achieve a good result finally or secondly have access to local seed sources and concentrate on the species of highest value if you have your volunteers don't send them out to collect cone flowers and other stuff that stuff is so cheap it's not worth their time. 
when you get into lilies 